This is Clive Brook. Today I want to tell you something about the special branch of Scotland Yard. I expect you've heard of it. Judging from some detective novels, you'd imagine it consisted of a group of super Sherlock Holmeses who are called in when everything else has failed. But that is not true, is it, Percy? I know, Clive. The special branch of Scotland Yard is a unit of a couple of hundred men who specialise in political crimes. They differ from their colleagues of the Criminal Investigation Department in that they must be able to speak several languages. In fact, the function of the special branch in official language is to guard the security of the state. Or, as the boys themselves put it, to clear up political nuisances. So today, a special branch man may find himself guarding the king or the prime minister, probing the antecedents of political refugee who seeks the protection of British nationality, tracking down the perpetrators of a bomb outrage, or sauntering among the guests at a royal garden party. Clive, why don't you tell them the story of the absent-minded professor? All right, Percy, I will. It's a story which shows the far-reaching significance of political crime and how, wherever an international conspiracy may start, sooner or later its tentacles will come within the reach of the long arm of the special branch of Scotland Yard. Ottawa, Canada, September 1945. One war is over, but for at least one of the great powers, another war, a secret war of information, a nerve war has never ceased. It is late in the evening and the offices of the Canadian Ministry of Justice are almost deserted. The last few employees are on the way home, and one of the officials is evidently trying to get rid of a late visitor. Coming in to see us, sir, but I'm afraid there's really nothing I can do about it. Why don't you write us a letter? But you don't understand. I'm very sorry, sir, but I'm afraid I have to go now. Thanks for calling. Please. I'm very sorry. Yeah. I thought I'd never get rid of that guy. What do you want? Oh, some screwball. Said he came from the Soviet embassy. Wanted to show me some secret documents. You're kidding. No, but I guess he was. Tried to tell me all about some fifth column. Crazy guy. (laughs) What's his name? Oh, I don't know. Here, here's a slip he sent in. Igor G. O. U. (laughs) Gazenko. Igor Guzenko, 25-year-old cyber clerk, employed in the code room of the military section of the Soviet embassy in Ottawa. Igor Guzenko, a man whose story was to shock the world, a man whose information was to bring to justice traitors of three nations who had endeavored to betray the Allies' greatest secret, the atom bomb. But this September night, Igor Guzenko is finding it very hard to tell his story. Nobody believes him. And yet all the time he knows that at the Soviet embassy, his desertion will have been discovered. Already his one-time colleagues will be moving into action against him. What can he do? To whom can he turn? Inspector McLean. Where? Who's that? Gozenko's. Well, well, who are these guys breaking in? Hmm? From the Soviet Embassy. Searching the place, eh? Well, listen, have you have you traced Kozenko? Well, you picked him up. Oh, he wanted to be arrested. I well, don't blame him. Well, now, listen, hold on to Kozenko and all his papers. Get hold of his family and don't let anybody see him. Yeah. Well, move him out of town and come back to me for instructions. Now, remember, nobody must see Kozenko. In a matter of hours, it was clearly established that not only were Guzenko's documents genuine, but that they included copies of four recent and secret telegrams exchanged between the British and Canadian governments on highly confidential matters. 
and realizing the complete freedom which exists in Canada and convinced that the Communist Party in democratic countries has changed long ago from a political party into an agency net for the Soviet government. A fifth column in these countries to meet a war. I decided that I could no longer serve my government, but must at last speak the truth. The Canadian police authorities found in Kuzenko's documents a fascinating story of how, in secret code, the Soviet military attaché in Ottawa had given information and received instructions from... Moscow. Message to Zavotl, Ottawa. Your immediate objectives are... One, the atomic bomb, its composition and technological processes. Two, a sample of uranium-235. Three, the library and secret documents of the National Research Council. Four, latest developments of electronic fuses for shells, radar, and a super explosive known as RDX. Reporting to Moscow, facts are given by Alec. One, the test of the atomic bomb was conducted in New Mexico. The bomb dropped on Japan was made of uranium-235. Two, Alec handed over to us a sample of uranium-235. Three, Alec has also reported brief data concerning electronic shells. There is in the shell a small radio transmitter with one electronic tube, and it is fed by dry batteries. The body of the shell is the antenna. Moscow to Sabota. Work out and telegraph arrangements for the meeting and password of Alec with our man in London. Sabota to Moscow. Alec will work in King's College, Strand. Meetings October 7, 17, 27. On the street in front of the British Museum. The time 11 o'clock in the evening. Identification sign, a newspaper under the left arm. Password, best regards to Michael. But even Moscow realized that their boys in Britain might have rather a busy evening identifying Alex from the number of Londoners with newspapers under their arms in Museum Street at 11 o'clock in the evening. They replied, Arrangements not satisfactory. Correction. Facing British Museum. Intersection Great Russell Street, Museum Street. Time, 8 o'clock, October 7, 17, 27. Identification signs. Alec will have under his left arm the newspaper Times. The contact man will have in his left hand the magazine Picture Post. Convey instructions to Alec. Convey instructions to Alec. Who was Alec? The Canadian police authorities at once placed the facts of this alarming leakage of atomic secrets before Prime Minister Mackenzie King. Realizing the grave implications of the plot, Mr. King hastened to Washington to acquaint President Truman with the situation. Four days later, the Canadian Prime Minister crossed the Atlantic and repeated the story to British Premier Mr. Clement Attlee. Officials of British military intelligence were called to Downing Street. The investigation was entrusted to Lieutenant Colonel Leonard Burt. Burt, a pre-war yard chief, was seconded to the war office at the beginning of the war for anti-sabotage work. Incidentally, today, he's back at the yard in command of the special branch. The Colonel's immediate and priority mission was to identify Alec. Well, I don't expect we shall have much trouble finding out who Alec is. Our main problem is going to be to get him, to find out how much he knows, and even more important, how much he has told. Yes, sir. Now, let's have a look at those cables again. Ah, here we are. Alec will work in King's College, Strand. Give him the phone directly. Here we are, sir. Thank you. Okay. Okay. King's College, Temple Bar, 5651. Well, hello, King's College. I'll put him through to the principal's office, will you? Thank you. Oh, hello. Uh, this is Lieutenant Colonel Burt of the War Office. Uh, I wonder if you could help me. It's just a routine inquiry. I want to know whether you have on your staff at the moment a physicist who has recently worked in Canada. Yes, that's right. Oh, up to a few months ago? You have? Oh, good. I see, yes. Yes, that's right. He went with a research group on a project in Montreal, and he's just come back to London. Good. And uh, what's his name? Dr. Nun May. Thank you, that'll be all. Oh, sounds like our man. And October the 7th looks like our day, sir. Four days from now, we'll have to get busy. As October the 7th approached... A number of well-built but unobtrusive men began renting rooms in Museum Street. Rooms with first-floor windows which looked out onto the forecourt of the British Museum. 
In this and many other ways, known only to MI5 and the special branch, every inch of the place of rendezvous was covered by one or two observers. Inspector Burt? Sergeant Wilson here, sir. All right, Wilson. I know you haven't seen him. Not a sign, sir. That's not surprising. I've just had a report from the man who shadowed him from King's College. He left there at half past six, went straight home, had supper, and according to his last call, he's now sitting in front of the fire, doing guess what? Search me, sir. Playing patience. Playing patience. And if anybody knows how to play patience, it's the men of the special branch. On October the 7th, they drew a blank, but they still had two more chances. Dr. Nunmay was shadowed constantly, but always unobtrusively. On October the 17th and again on the 27th, the watchers by the British Museum kept their vigil. But Dr. Nunmay did not keep his appointment. It's no use, Wilson. He must have been warned. Do you think he's suspicious, sir? Oh, he may know he's being watched, but I don't think so. Not yet, anyway. Uh, what do you mean, not yet, sir? I think it's about time Dr. Nunmay and I had a little talk. I'm going round to King's College. How do you do, Professor? Uh, my name is Bert, Inspector Bert of Military Intelligence. Uh, how do you do? Uh, military Intelligence, did you say? Oh, that's right. I don't want to waste your time, Professor, so I'll come straight to the point. Are you aware that there's been a leakage of confidential information in Canada relating to atomic energy? Really, Inspector? I, I don't know what to say. Uh, uh, certainly, it's the first I've heard of it. The first you've heard of it? Of course, I must say, Inspector, that I, I don't read the papers very much. I wasn't suggesting that you'd have read it in the papers. I was wondering whether you'd... Uh, had some first-hand knowledge. What do you mean, Inspector? Just this. I want you to answer one or two questions for me. During the period you spent in Canada in connection with the Atomic Energy Commission, were you approached at any time or by any person to give information concerning your work? Certainly not. And, and I think I should say, Inspector, that, that if the Department of the War Office you represent is concerned with uh, uh, counter-espionage or anything of that nature, I'm not prepared to answer any of your questions. But you do say that you were not approached and did not give any information whatsoever. That is correct. Inspector Burt sensed that despite his answers in his bold front, the little professor was rather worried. When the special branch finds that a suspect is worried, they usually proceed to worry him just a little more. All right, Wilson. There are your instructions starting tomorrow. I want the men in Stafford Street and everybody who's covering none may to change their technique. So far, their aim has been to be as unobtrusive as possible. From tomorrow, I want Dr. Nunmay to know that he's being watched. So the men of MI5, under the direction of Inspector Burt, began the next phase of the war they were conducting against the little professor. In the next few days, the shadowing was performed in a manner scarcely creditable to the reputation of Scotland Yard. Meantime, a message had been sent to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, who were instructed to inquire how closely Dr. May's travels had fitted into the pattern outlined for Alec in the cables which had been intercepted between Moscow and Ottawa. Royal Canadian Mounted Police to Burt, Special Branch, Scotland Yard. Information supplied by Dr. John Douglas Cocroft, Chief of the Atomic Energy Project at Montreal, shows Dr. May made several trips to the nuclear research laboratories of the Manhattan Project at Chicago, coinciding entirely with the reports from Alec. Dr. May left for England within a few days of his last trip to the research laboratories and is scheduled to return for a month's work next year. Everything checks up with the information in our possession concerning Alec. Yes, and the signal goes on to say that no other scientist has followed the same schedule or is planning to return next year. Yes, everything fits. It must be Dr. Nunmay. Meantime, officials of the United States Federal Bureau of Investigation had entered the story. The information concerning Dr. May was sent to the headquarters of the Manhattan Engineer District in Washington, D.C. One of the fundamental principles of United States military intelligence is that personnel on secret projects are entitled to know only as much as they require to carry on their work. 
Thus, months before, when the National Research Council of Canada had proposed that Dr. May be allowed to visit the United States for one month, the application had been placed before General Groves personally. The general had sent for the file on Dr. May. It included the information that Dr. May had already visited the Chicago Atomic Research Laboratories three times, and that this third visit occurred between September 25 and October the 30th, 1944. He carried on extensive work in collaboration with other scientists in a highly secret and important new field. His work resulted in a research report in which he collaborated with an American scientist. To Groves, a fourth visit by May to the United States ran counter to security principles, for it would allow him to know too much of what was going on in widely separated projects. Accordingly, the answer had gone back, polite but firm, no. If vital secrets in the field of atomic energy still rest secure, must credit must be given to General Groves' decision to bar Dr. May. For as the Canadian Royal Commission of Inquiry had stated, the Soviets failed to obtain details on the structure of the atomic bomb only because there was no one in Canada who could tell them. That all this was in the future. Back in London in September 1945, Lieutenant Colonel Burt had still to complete his case against Dr. Nan May. After waiting for one more week, during which the professor must have been well aware that he was being shadowed by the yard, the colonel went back to see the professor again. So you see, professor... I thought it would be a good idea if I came back to have another little talk with you. Yes. Yes. You see, I wanted to tell you that we know that you had an appointment to meet someone in the vicinity of the British Museum shortly after your return from Canada. Well? Who was that person? And why didn't you keep the appointment? Y yes, uh, you're quite right. I didn't keep the appointment. And who was the person? When I came back to London, I, I decided to wash my hands of the whole business. What business? The, 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 the matter this person was going to see me about. It's no use, Professor. You see, we know too much. I tell you, I have nothing more to say. I think you will have something more to say. And I am quite prepared to wait until you are ready to say it. I, I absolutely refuse. If you think you can persuade me into making some sort of statement... I... Inspector Bird didn't think. He knew. He realized that a man like Dr. Nunmay, conscious of the fact he was being followed, nervous and frightened, would in the end have to come clean. Well, Dr. Nunmay didn't tell the whole truth. But at least he started to tell part of the truth, and at the end of this interview, he gave a long statement. About a year ago, whilst in Canada, I was contacted by an individual whose identity I declined to divulge. He, he called on me at my private apartment in Swale Avenue, Montreal. He apparently knew I was employed by the Montreal Laboratory, and he sought information from me concerning atomic research. I gave, and had given very careful consideration to uh, correctness of making sure that development of atomic energy was not confined to the USA. I took the very painful decision uh, that it was necessary to convey general information on atomic energy and make sure that it was taken seriously. For this reason, I, I decided to entertain a proposition made to me by the individual who called on me. After this uh, preliminary meeting, I, I met the individual on several subsequent occasions in Canada. He made specific requests for information which were just nonsense to me. What do you mean by that? I could not understand what he was talking about. Did he ask you for samples of uranium? Yes, uh, and for information generally on atomic energy. And do you admit to giving him samples? Yes. Uh, uh, at one meeting, I gave the man uh, microscopic amounts of U-233 and U-235, uh, one of each. The U-235 was a slightly enriched sample and was in a small glass tube and consisted of about a milligram of oxide. The U-233 was about a tenth of a milligram and was a very thin deposit on a platinum foil and was back to the piece of paper. What else did you give him? I uh, also gave him a written report on uh, atomic research as known to me. This information was mostly of a character which has since been published or is about to be published. Anything else? Uh, the man... Uh, also asked for information about the American electro uh, electronically controlled ACAC shells. And what did you do? I knew very little about these and so could only give very little information. Anything else? He also asked to people employed in the laboratory, including a man named Veal, but I advised him against that him. And uh, what did he give you? Well, he gave me some dollars. How many? I forget how many. He gave me a whiskey bottle. I, I accepted these against my will. I see. And when was your last contact? Uh, before I left Canada. It was arranged that on my return to London, I was to keep an appointment with somebody I did not know. I, I was given precise details as to making... Uh, what were those details? 
I forget them now. Why didn't you keep the appointment? Because I had decided that this clandestine procedure was no longer appropriate in view of the official release of information and the possibility of satisfactory international control of atomic energy. I see. Is that the end of your statement? Yes. The, the, the whole affair was extremely painful to me. I only embarked on it because I felt that this was a contribution I could make to the safety of mankind. I certainly did not do it for gain. So much for the professor's statement. The special branch of Scotland Guard had already unearthed more incriminating evidence. Here we are, sir. I've made a summary of these papers that have come in from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Oh, thank you. Let's see here. Dr. Nun May, etc., etc., etc. Ah, ardent communist. Here's just what I expected. Hmm, I see they picked up eight of his friends in Canada. And do you see this, Wilson? Definite statements. The doctor visited other atomic projects at the request of the Soviet embassy. Well, I think our case is ready now. It's about time we brought in the director of public prosecutions. Bring in all the other files on the case. And so it happened that a few days later, while Dr. Nunmay was lecturing a class of students at King's College on the subject of nuclear theory, he had a visit from the special branch. That, I think, brings us almost to the end of our work today. We have, of course, only touched upon one phase of the subject of nuclear theory. And I hope that tomorrow afternoon I shall have the chance of dealing with chapters 7 and 8 in the papers under discussion and that we manage to write a lot of ground. <coughs> uh, that will be all. <coughs> Excuse me, just one moment, please. Uh, yes, what is it? You are Dr. Nun May. Yes. I have a warrant for your arrest. I must warn you. Uh, yes, yes, I, I was expecting something like this. Well, if you'll just follow me. And so Dr. Nun May was not able to continue his lecture the following day. For he had a pressing appointment at Bow Street where the following morning he was formally charged with... Having for a purpose prejudicial to the safety and interests of the state communicated to some persons unknown certain information calculated to be directly or indirectly useful to an enemy, contrary to the Official Secrets Act of 1911. At the Old Bailey, Mr. Justice Oliver said, I have listened with slight surprise to some of the things learned counsel has put before me. The picture of you as a man of honor who had only done what you believed to be right. I do not take that view at all. How any man in your position could have had the crass conceit, let alone the wickedness, to arrogate to himself the decision of a matter of this sort, where you yourself had given your written understanding not to do it, and knew it was one of the country's most precious secrets when you yourself had drawn and were drawing pay for years to keep your bargain with your country. That you could have done this is a dreadful thing. I think that you acted not as an honorable man, but as a dishonorable man. I think that you acted with degradation. Whether money was the object of what you did, in fact, you did get money for what you did. It is a very bad case indeed. The sentence upon you is one of ten years' penal servitude. Well, that isn't quite the end of the story, because after the trial, there were many protests that the sentence was out of all proportion to the magnitude of the offence committed. The Association of Scientific Workers issued a statement in which they declared... We do not seek to justify Dr. May's breach of the Official Secrets Act, but we are convinced, from our knowledge of Dr. May, that his action was determined only by the principle that fundamental scientific data should have been shared with a country that was not only friendly, but a fighting ally. The only work in which Dr. May was engaged, and on which he could have been in a position to give unauthorized information, concerned fundamental scientific data relating to atomic energy. Dr. May had no connection whatever with problems of the construction of the atomic bomb and could not have been able to reveal information on atomic bomb manufacture. Mm, what about that, Percy? Oh, and by the way, I was going to ask you, why do you call this the case of the absent-minded professor? 
Because, Clive, while the professor may have been internationally minded about the secrets of atomic energy, you must remember he also gave away the secrets of electronic shells. Mm, you've got something there, Percy. But you know what these absent-minded professors are? Which reminds me of a story. Time's up, Clive. Yes, I'm afraid it is. But I have to leave it until next week. Well, that's all for today. This is Clive Brook saying goodbye and uh, pleasant dreams. <laughs>